Hello, and welcome to this special edition of the weekly recap of the Denver Church of Christ. My name is Chris Zoman, and this week I am doing an interview. The interview is with Vince Hawkins, who is the evangelist of the St. Louis Church of Christ. Vince is an African-American minister who's been a disciple for decades. Him and I have worked together for at least 15 years doing campus ministry work across the U.S. I'm going to be asking Vince some questions about his experience with racism in this country. I'm also going to be asking him some questions about his experience of race within our churches. We're going to talk a little bit about what this time it means for us in the current events right now with our church since the death of Ahmaud Arbery and Breonna Taylor and George Floyd and countless others before that, but how we can discuss these issues within the church and what he's doing in St. Louis. So thank you so much for joining me. This is a little bit of a longer edition of Weekly Recap, but hang in there. I think you'll enjoy the conversation that we have. There's a lot of laughter, but there's a lot of poignant discussion as well. Thank you for coming along with me. Hello, and welcome to the Denver Church of Christ Weekly Recap. My name is Chris Zoman. It's great to be here with you today. And today, we're doing something a little bit different. I've got one of my favorite people in the world, Vince Hawkins, joining us for the Weekly Recap. Vince, it's great to have you in Denver, sort of. Come on, bros. Good to be with you. Hello, Denver. Hey, you've, got a, you, you you've got a little history with Denver, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Two and a half years in Denver. Great time. Uh, lived in Aurora, lived in Littleton. Oh, that's where lived, I live. Lived over in Wash Park there for a little while. It's a lot of fun. So, who are who are some of the members that are might still be here that you remember, like old timers? Well, uh, when I first got there, uh, we were discipled by the Chooks. Oh yeah, and Tony Chooks discipled me. Super uh, super old. I mean, he's an old yeah. guy. And he's slapping me good. <laughs> uh, and uh, Carlos and Dimitri Clark. Oh, yeah. They discipled us for a little while. Um, you know, and they, yep. they, they they got us at a very, we were probably a low point in our lives, but they were very gentle and loving with us. And is Carlos still a cop? Uh, nope. No, he's, he's, you know what he does? He does uh, professional weightlifting and bodybuilding or weightlifting. Really? I think. Like a power, I'm, I don't want to say it wrong, but I think it's like powerlifting. No, he's, he's amazing. And they're phenomenal, yep. very talented singers. Oh, man, the well, best. Yep. Yeah. Did he teach you a thing or two about singing, song leading? I did learn a lot from Carlos. I did. I, you know, I was, well, I'm still prideful, but I was young and prideful. And <laughs> I don't know how much I listened, but he's hard. That's you know. hard to imagine. <laughs> That's right. That's Vince, right. Vince is my favorite song leader in our churches. He is, he, when he is up there, it's just joy. Like you, whatever he's feeling, you begin feeling while he's up there. And so he's one of the best. Well, Vince, thank you so much uh, for joining me today. And, you know, we're going to talk a little bit about race. There's a lot to talk about. And that's a, that's a topic that is, is so loaded. And there is so much going on with that topic since uh, the murder of George Floyd. But before that, Ahmaud Arbery and, um, you know, countless you know, countless cases, and sure, sure. our ch our churches are really wrestling with it right now. Right, right. And so, I wanted to start just by asking you, kind of, just about your your personal history with racism, where you grew up, um, what what are some of the you know what are some of the injustice maybe that you experienced in your own personal life, and you know, and, and how does this topic personally relate to you? Sure, sure. Well, you know. Um, like many people, you know, I mean, you, you, you can't help but watch that video and feel grief, right? Just for, yeah. you know, to watch a human life and to know that you, you watched a person die is even more traumatic. So it was definitely painful, definitely hurtful. Um, you know, I cried. I watched his funeral. I was able to hear his family share about him. Uh, that was good for me, but it brought, it made me think about some situations in my life. I mean, I think probably not unlike many young um, African Americans, and I think this may be true more for men than women, I can't really say, but um, at least when I was growing up, you probably had some kind of traumatic racial experience by the time you were like 11 or 12. And for me, I was living in uptown New Orleans. I grew up in the inner city of New Orleans. Um, that's where I was raised in inner city of New Orleans. But right before that, I was living in a 
pretty, uh, right when we moved, we lived in a rather diverse area. And, um, you know, there was a park nearby and we were sort of in the black neighborhood, but there was some, you know, white neighborhoods nearby. So you go out to the park, see all kind of kids. Anyway, I bumped into a white kid out there. We play, I go back the next day. We play, this park was literally a block from my house. And it was in the days when your parents would just let you go two blocks from the house to the park and play. I probably was eight years old. Yeah. And um, so he and I would play. One day his sister showed up who was quite a bit older. Um, and I don't know how old she was, but she was a teenager, I, I would imagine. I was eight. She was kind of a big, you know, tall girl. She, they're both white. So they say, hey, let's go for a walk. And so I'm like, hey, you know, but I'm kind of afraid to say no. And this boy was even a year older than me. So I'm getting a little farther away from my house, a little farther away from my house. I'm getting a little nervous, but I still know my way home. Yeah. And all of a sudden, a fight breaks out. Another white kid shows up. And they kind of jump me. I'm eight. And they're calling me all kind of N-words and this, that, and the other. And I'm kind of trying to fight them off. And I'm... I think I'm kind of beating up the one kid who was playing with me because he really wasn't into it so much. Mm -hmm. And then next thing you know, they got me off my feet and they throw me into a dumpster. And, you know, yeah. slam the lid over me. And I could hear them outside saying this or that. And I'd open and they'd throw stuff at me so I couldn't get out. So I didn't know how long this was gonna last. But eventually I peeked out and I was able to sneak out and run and get home. Yeah. But I remember that and I remember thinking, and it was at that moment that in my heart, I became, I will never trust another white person again, ever. Yeah. That's how I felt. That was about eight, I was about eight years old at that point. What happened though, Zillman, after that though, is that I did get an opportunity with sports to obviously play with a lot of kids. I played with that park. There were black and white kids on that team. I didn't hang out, talk with them. I just played and that was pretty decent. Then we moved over to the inner city. It's all blacks. Still getting a lot of heat even from black folks, but you know, I don't have to interact with white people anymore until we play in sports competitions. Right. I go to college. I'm sorry, I go to high school. We play against white teams. It was always the blacks against the whites. I get to college, start breaking down these walls a little bit through college and education and being around lots of people. I put my guard down, not a lot, ever so slightly, you know, just enough to engage and survive. And uh, while at the University of Nebraska, I mean, I'm on a great team and that's when I'm met as a disciple by a couple of white guys, Kurt Simmons and Aaron Brefford, both who these guys never sent to plant the church in Lincoln. Yeah. And they studied the Bible with me. And I'd say sports helped a little bit with my mindset, at least my amount of time I had to interact. Yeah. But it was really becoming a disciple that transformed my thinking. Um, it was really the first time that I could say I ever trusted uh, anyone that wasn't black. And to be honest with you, didn't even trust black folks that much either personally. Just right. to be honest with you, I didn't trust a lot of people. So Yeah. And so in the process of studying the Bible, you were faced to you you had to face some of the some of the trauma of growing up in and... Absolutely. Had to face that, had to face the trauma, had to make Jesus Lord of my life. I mean, I'm in Lincoln, Nebraska on a mission team. Not a lot of black folks in Nebraska well, they did two black folks because <laughs> i think they thought there would be no black people and of course within the first month they baptized about five or six black people <laughs> so, you know but hey and so what did you what did you think the first time you walked in to that church good question i said they, they were meeting in a in a hotel they you know it was in those days they had looks like they had 150 chairs out but there were only about 50 people you know it was those days yeah put out a lot of chairs, they'll come. Yeah. <laughs> all that did for me is when I walked in, I scanned the crowd really quick and I sat all the way in the back. <laughs> so and everyone kept turning around inviting me up and I thought, no, just a few too many white folks in here. So I'll sit back here. And what, what and what was it? I'm sure walking in that was uncomfortable and maybe I, 
the first time you came, were you like, I'm not coming back here again? Or, did, or was there something that, what was it that made you go, okay, I need to look into this? Well, I was invited by Aaron Bradford, who lived on my floor. Yeah. And so I knew him. And I, I didn't know him, but I just had seen him. And so that was, you know, kind of helpful. And I was going to see him again. Okay. You know, so, <laughs> you know, I was okay with that. To be honest, the two black people came back to say hi to me, and I just felt like it was kind of a token effort. So I just, right. you know, <laughs> but Aaron and I followed up later. He asked me how it went, and, and and he was the right guy because he wasn't really trying to like shake my hand and be cool and hey, bro. And he was just kind of a goofy, rather dorky white guy, and I'm just going. Okay, <laughs> I mean, it did. It wasn't off-putting because he was so right. authentic. He was right. just authentic, and it wasn't off-putting to me. It was he yeah. was fun to me, and he'd always ask, "What are you laughing?" At? I'm just laughing at you, man. <laughs> <laughs> you like, well, and you and I, you and I both know Aaron Brett you know very. Aaron. <laughs> Aaron is nothing if not persistent, and so <laughs> I, I get the idea that well, he's going to keep asking me. So. That's exactly right. In his own authentic way, he yep. was trying to be, an, and I loved that about him. So we're best friends for life. So. so at what point in being in the church did you decide that you wanted to, to be in the ministry then? Yeah. Well, I was kind of, you know, I, I, was, I was pretty amazed from the very beginning, even during my Bible studies, that uh, these guys knew their Bible so well. But I was just impressed with how they, how they could challenge me not knowing me, challenge me on things. I'm just going, you don't know who I am, dude. Like. <laughs> I could like punch, I could beat you up and get, I mean, I, I felt like that. So I yeah. thought these guys must be really serious about their faith because they were authentic. They were real. And I, I appreciate authenticity. <laughs> I, yeah. I, I did, I guess. I just went, you guys are the real deal, man. And um, that's legit. You know, you like really love God. I've been around a lot of fake God stuff. I felt like, so this was the real deal. So I trusted them. It, it, it's completely irrational that I trusted these guys. Didn't yeah. make any sense at all. It was just the Holy Spirit. So at what point did you, right after college, did you go in the ministry? Yeah. Or, so, and, and, and I do want to be clear, like you, you were a football player at the University of Nebraska. You kind of glanced over that. And so yeah. that's it. I mean, there's nothing else in Nebraska, but nebraska football and so you were i mean you're low-key celebrity in nebraska um yeah. and you get reached out to basically in a white church and yeah. at, you know at what point were you like okay i, I want to do the ministry now i want to i want to do this for my life sure 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 well i do appreciate this uh you know we were <laughs> we drive the church sometimes and we sing these songs and i'd say hey have you ever thought about doing the song this way soon and very soon and they're like no we have not thought about doing that. <laughs> why don't you do that <laughs> no like, no we've not <laughs> said, so why don't you do it i'm like nah i'm not doing uh, so they kept pushing me yeah. into like okay and of course at first everyone's kind of smiling and snapping yeah. on feet but i you know it was a it was a it was a it was um it was meant to be you know yeah and so that's kind of how i got a song lead. but but that was my first taste of leadership and then from there more leadership opportunities and and leading a bible talk i really wanted to lead a bible talk at, for my for the football players and and i just got hit with the i think the more i would come to denver and i met their staff members and prideful as i was i sort of always see people and measure them like oh, I could do that <laughs> <You know? laughs> not always the right attitude right yeah. but um I, I just thought it really seemed like it's what God wanted me to do uh impact people I wanted to have the kind of impact in people's lives that Kurt and Aaron had in my life how could I do that and do that in a full-time way and as I saw and I would read those discipleship magazines and see the impact that we we're making Frankly, even around the world and to see come to the Denver church and to see how diverse it was, I just thought, this is awesome. Yep. This is awesome. I would love to commit my life to working for this group. So, Well, and Vince, you and I met 15 years ago. Crazy, huh? And we were doing, I, I was, we were both leading small churches with big campuses. In right. Them. And, um, 
and we began doing ministry and training programs together yeah. and we were pretty fat we were very fast friends um but over the course of your i mean you've been a minister for 25 years 25 years yeah 25 years you know almost 25 almost 25 yeah can you maybe describe your experience being a black minister in, in our, in our churches? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think I went through a period of time, um, where I thought that, you know, I never thought I couldn't succeed because I never thought I couldn't succeed because of my skin color, right? Um, I, I never thought that. I thought I could do it's whatever success is, right? So, I, But I just thought, I can do this. And I knew there was a need for people like me. And I had good people in my life saying, you know, you can do this. But um, I did have moments. I mean, I think I have moments where I default back to like, oh, this is probably, I can't trust this person. Or, okay, God, you're in control with this person. So I would have those kind of moments. That always comes back, Zilna. Yeah. You know, uh, and frankly, it comes back when things aren't going sometimes the way I think they should go sure. or the way I want them to go. And that's something I, that I've always had to, you know, because I've often had that thought, you know. I used to have a reoccurring dream that, you know, that if I was older in that dumpster, they would have been in the dumpster. You know what I mean, sure. I, I mean, and so I, I wanted to look for an opportunity to, to kind of pay people back, if you will. And and uh, in football, honestly, in some ways, I went to an all boys, all black high school. We were in, we broke into a Catholic league, which was white at the time in New Orleans. And so playing against white schools, this is where I became a Christian. Try, this was back when you actually wanted to injure people in football. I know you right. can't do that anymore. <laughs> right. But trying to injure white guys or injuring white guys is what we we loved. So I know it's cruel. It's brutal. I confessed all this and repented of it when I got baptized. But I, I was pretty messed up. So anyway, I go back to that less and less now that I'm older. I'm 50 years old, 51 years old now. Mm-hmm. But earlier on, those tapes, they, they want to play. And so I have to kind of let that go constantly. So, yeah. but leaning into relationships and people, relationships with men like you, you know, I mean, you're a dear friend that I trust. And you trust me. Yep. And so that's, that's, that's always helpful for me. So when this thing happened, I called my African-American members, but I started calling some of my, my white friends as well. Yeah. How you doing? Yeah. You know, and, you know, because I just want to make sure that, I don't know, you know, I love you. I wanted to reaffirm to them that I trust them. Yeah. So, no, it's amazing. That's I mean, just how I respond, though. I'm yeah. not saying everyone should respond that way, but that's what Vince Hawkins needs to do to remain a Christian. Yeah. Okay. No, and I, and I appreciate that. And, and Vince, now, I mean, you, you've been a few different places leading. Now you lead the St. Louis Church. You've been doing that for how long have you been in St. Year Louis? Year and a half. Year, year and a half. Year and a half. Okay. So you, you and I both are in, in somewhat newer situations. Right. Um, there's a lot that's happened in the last year, year and a half. Um, and what are, you know, what are some of the things that you have done, especially over the past you know, month, few months to minister to this specific um, situation, the, 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 the topic of race, the, the, the topic of, of anger and fear that surrounds, uh, surrounds these issues. How have you been ministering to your own fellowship um, during this time? Well, you know, um, one of the things is, is that, uh, you know, I just had this conversation and, you know, the first thing is, is that, I'm trying to be authentic, I'm just trying to be real where I'm at. And so I think when this first came out, I, I, I talked about it. I, I cried, you know, we're on Zoom. Um, I just hurt. And I heard about different things at different times. You know, I will say this. I believe that our country is grieving. 
I believe we're grieving. You know how there's those various stages of grief, right? You know, the, there's a stage of denial. I think that's a real stage of denial. I think people who may be in denial are probably grieving. And it's a funny thing when you're grieving. Sometimes people want to tell you how to grieve. Like, don't be in denial. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'll get out of denial. Don't be angry. You know what I mean? Yeah. And bartering, you know, bartering is, oh, I wish I had done this. I wish I had done. I mean, I have white friends that are like, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm like, what are you sorry for? I'm just sorry for being white. I'm, so, I'm like, what, what are you talking about? I mean, there's all of this, the bartering, right? Mm -hmm. And then there's depression. I was telling my church just this past week, I think I'm somewhere between myself bartering and grieving. Like, oh, what could I have, you know, and, I'm sorry, bartering and depression. Yeah. And, uh, and I feel depressed sometimes. You know, I didn't sleep that great last night. I'm not, some nights I sleep well, some nights I don't. Yeah. But I'm grieving for our country. I'm grieving for humanity. I'm grieving as I think that, wow, because there's some places I thought maybe we were, we weren't. Not only, you know, uh, the country, and while I like to say nothing surprises me, humanity yeah. is, fall, is broken. But I grieve a little bit. I grieve as I watch people. I mean, I, I grieve when I watch. I never thought in my lifetime I'd see white men burning black businesses, yelling "Black Lives Matter." Duh. <laughs> yeah. What is happening? So I grieve for humanity. I just grieve for the things that are going on. I just go. So I'm grieving. And I grieve something a little different every day. Yeah. Um, and I think a lot of people are, I think people that, and this is the thing, some of us think people, you don't care. And you know, I'm like, they're grieving. You can't not grieve. And I think these are times when it might be good, maybe for us to cut each other a little slack. Yeah. To be a little merciful, you know, and maybe. Yeah. Perhaps, you know, yep. uh, instead of telling people, quit being angry and do this and do that when, when we're grieving. But, you know, you just got to go through it. And that's what I'm trying to do. I'm going through it and I'm letting my church know it's okay to grieve. And in that process of grieving, let's listen to one another respectfully. Let's share with one another respectfully. Let's be godly. Let's be gracious to one another. Yeah. It, you know, it's a process, though. Um, it really is. So that's what I would say, Chris. So you've been, you've been, it sounds like you've been trying to be patient, give people their space to go through this in the way that they need to go through this. Um, you know, I was, as you were talking, one of the things I was thinking about is the way that social media plays a part in, you know, in, in what's happening right now. And, and even as, as people in our own churches communicate with one another and, you know, what, do you have any advice or input for kind of the role of social media or, the, or, or, how, or how we talk to one another, you know, during this time? Well, you know, no. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I have, a, <laughs> yeah. I have a lot I can say about it, but here's what I will say is that everyone, I, I firmly believe that everyone wants the same thing. I believe that. And I think if we would ask the next question but what happens is is sometimes somebody says something somebody says <laughs> like and it's just reacting 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 and so i but but this kind of is what happens when we really aren't really want to give each other space yeah and we don't give each other you know that we're not we don't trust and so even when someone says something that's unrighteous then we got to go correct them we gotta you can't say that right. you know, it's like, you, know you, you you're going to fall away from Jesus if I don't fix you, right? So right. They're, they're just grieving. I mean, we're, we're all grieving. Yeah. And so everybody's got to jump on one another. So I, I, I don't know. I, I just, I tell people to be authentic. I don't spend any time on Facebook. It would yeah. be imp inappropriate for me to get on Facebook and to say anything. Um, and I'm going to grieve in a way that I, that I'm just going to grieve and, no one's gonna tell me how to grieve. <laughs> yeah. That's how I feel. I'm I'm gonna get through this. I'm gonna go through it. And anybody that tries to tell me how to grieve is 
probably gonna have a problem. <laughs> yeah. So. Well, and, and I, I actually, I really appreciate, I mean, there's so many times where I've seen something online and I'm just like, oh, Oh, yeah. ouch. and and there is there is a there's a huge temptation to I've got to somehow try and make this right right now like I've got to I've got to get involved and manage the situation and I appreciate what you're saying because I do I think it goes along with what your original point was is you've got to let people go through this yeah. you know and there's no rushing people through it and there's no there's no telling people how to go through it and you know and all this is on a spectrum and I I feel the same pain you, you I I have a reluctance to tell anyone how they should act on, on social media, um, yeah. ex except to say, just don't be stupid. Um, <laughs> but you know, I, yeah. how people interpret that is very different. And um, it's not really, it's not really helpful input. Um, but I do, I do appreciate I this. Just know whatever we put out there. It it's there. The it's there. Yeah. That's I, got gonna... a, I got a very dear friend of mine. He works at a school, very sweet guy, his son, when he was 14, 15 years old, posted something. And then posted something else, post something else. This three years ago. Someone found it, brought it forward, put stickers on it, blah, 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 and launched it out there to people as if it was written here recently. And it was foolish stuff that the boy had written. He's a white boy, kid, who at 14 years old said something stupid. And today, it is now... Like he wrote it today, you know, and, and I think that's, that's very unfortunate. So, yep. um, but yeah, that's, that's what I will say. No, that's definitely, when you're not temperate, it, it comes back to haunt you. Yeah. You know, I know, uh, I know I can get worked up. So I, oh yeah. Settle down. Yeah. Um, you know, what advice would you give to those that, that want to do something right now. Like they, they want to do something. I mean, I think everybody, everybody who, like you said, is grieving over this, it's kind of our instinct in this country to like, we got to do something, you know? And, and so, you know, there, there are people that are a part of demonstrations, people, you know, leading protests, you know, the idea of like, what does social justice look like right now? What kind of, what kind of input or advice or thoughts do you have about that? Well, I think all I can say is for me personally, one of the things that's coming to the forefront for me is just how um, how much more I need to really embrace this idea of justice and what that looks like. Um, you know, I was, uh, you know, um, looking at the story of the Good Samaritan and going through this story with some people in our church a little bit and saying, okay, let's, let's read this story. And how does this um, impact us in our current context, right? And so we did that. I took some notes. We were going to preach on this. And then Bill Mold and I sat down together, and we were working through this passage together. I just kept feeling like there's something we're, I'm miss something we're missing here about this passage. And so then it hit me, you know, in that story, you know, the Bible says that, uh, that the man was left naked, right? Beaten, half dead, right? And the Samaritan comes by and he pours uh, oil and wine on him. Now he's naked, completely disgraced, completely disgraced. And so then he picks him up, he takes him to the, uh, to the end um, and he stays the night with him, Zillman. Now, taking him to the end would have been awesome. Yeah. You know, but he stayed the night, and that would have been awesome. But then he takes out two silver coins. He gives them to the innkeeper, and you go, wow, awesome. But then he does, he says, and if he racks up any bill, I'll take care of him when I get back. Now, the crazy thing about that story I find, and this, I'd never seen this before, Jesus said that the Samaritan had pity on him. But then at the end of the story, Jesus asked the, uh, the lawyer there, he says, now who was a good neighbor? And he said, the one who had mercy. There was nothing in that story that Jesus said anything about mercy. And so what hit me is that it's one thing to have pity. It's one thing to feel sorry. 
In fact, we don't know that the high priests and that the Levite didn't feel sorry and have pity. Maybe they did. But this guy had pity, and then he picked him up, he brought him to the end, stayed the whole night. Now he's going past pity. He's leaving coins, and he's saying, I'll take it. I mean, I imagine the innkeeper going, this guy went from totally disgraced to now he's got the sweet. He can drink the $5 bottle of water. You know what I'm saying? He can eat the snacks. He can order room <laughs> service. You know what I mean? Yeah. This guy has gone to a place that you cannot believe. And the guy goes, that is mercy. And so I see mercy as, I think as Christians, we have a responsibility to guard each man's dignity and crucify our pride. And what he did was, is he not only, he took him from no dignity, naked, in this world, no clothes, and he put him in a place and restored his dignity. And I think that's the tough work I'm going to have to do moving forward as a Christian, is be someone, can you help restore people's dignity? And I think that's going to that's gonna be my challenge going forward. Yeah. And so I want to be someone that guards each man's dignity, whether they become a Christian or not. And sometimes I think that's what people are struggling for is they, I just don't feel any dignity. And I think if we can do that tough work, Chris, we, 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 may, we may be able to help people who don't act in the image of God always. Yep we can at least try to restore them to the image of God. I think that's the challenge we got ahead. So. If you've never heard Vince Hawkins preach, you, you just did. And uh, it was such a great, such an inspiring answer to the idea of what we, of what we do now and the idea of restoring dignity. And I, it's it almost, it just gives you goosebumps that we have that ability. Like that's within each of us. It's at our fingertips. We can walk around every day doing something just just like that to those who have who have lost dignity or who have who've had it stripped from them forcibly and so it's tough too because i know that we want to do something big i know we want to we want to march on these systems and we want the systems to change things and i just i want that too okay <laughs> yeah but the reality is, is by the time they're done poking back and forth and bickering and putting stuff in it and all of that. And it makes its way down to us. We're going to be like, well, now we got another problem. So I just feel like, but boy, what if we all, what if everyone just began to do something? We don't like that slow process of one to another. Like Jesus, what we want is a big thing. And I get it. We want something big to happen. If we all, you know, and I go, man, Jesus could have done that. But instead, he just said, I'm going to take you, and I'm going to go one to another. So I don't know. I think that's the, I feel like that's what I'm reminding myself of. I'm not going to tell anybody what to do. Yep. That has nothing to do with whether you want to go whatever. Yep. But this is the hard work I see ahead for me, Vince Hawkins personally. I'm going to have to really start guarding people's dignity personally. No, I love it. And I can't tell you how many times I've just sat around with other people and go, well, if the, if the, if the government would just do this, this would fix that problem. If they just do this. All they it's have true. to do, all they have to do is this. And it, it's you know, true. It's true. But, I can't lie. It's true. If they would no, do that. Yeah. But you know, we just mess it up again. Like, like we're, we're going to invent some ways to hate one another. That's all there is to it. And, and I, and so I, I do always shudder to think, no, yeah, which, who are we asking to do this? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Let's <laughs> <But it's> not. <laughs> um, I mean, so, we across the board, we got to look. So, so you want that person to do it? Okay. Yeah. So, That's what I you're going to try. Both sides of the aisle, yeah. all across the board. I just go, yeah, we, 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 we as disciples, we actually can do better. Yeah. Than them. That's the cool thing. With the spirit of God inside of us, we can do better yeah. than them. No. You know, I, I think w one of the things that people are struggling with right now is because, you know, this, 
the, the topic of race and racism and bigotry and prejudice, it's, it's just fraught with landmines as you're trying to talk about it, as, as you're trying to have a discussion. What, what, what advice would you give to leaders right now that are struggling to, to talk to their own small groups and, and, have, and have meaningful, helpful conversations about this topic? What, what kind of advice do you have? Yeah, you know, I, I mean, I've gotten a lot of phone calls. I'm no expert on any of this, and I appreciate when people call, you know, they use, hey, how you doing? And then, you know, because we have a lot of diverse churches, and so, you know, yeah. I'll look down at the phone and go, oh, I, that's my brother. And how you doing? I'm doing fine. And they're going, so I'm a white guy. <laughs> <laughs> I get it, I get it, I get it. Yeah. I don't really have much to say. I say, bro, just be authentic. Yeah. Honestly, just be honest. Say where you're at. I don't know where, where are you? How are you feeling? I think if you're authentic, talk to your church is what I say. Because those people, they brought you in. They hired you. They want you there. They love you. Don't try to talk for the movement. Don't try to talk to people on Facebook. Don't try to talk to, you're, you're not, I'm not that special. Nobody really wants to hear what I have to say. You know what I mean? Apparently you do. But, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying, just talk to your people and just say, I'm lost. I'm hurting. I'm here. I'm there. If you don't get it, say you don't get it. But don't try to, don't try to copy and paste something and go, I read this today and this is how I feel. Oh, really? <laughs> I mean, yeah. I just think, just be authentic. That's all you can be, I think. And if that's not enough, I don't know what to say. Yeah. You know, and I think it, obviously we got to do the painstaking work of working within our groups and figuring out how to, you know, create conversation and listen to one another and share with one another all in the name of Jesus. That all that tough work's got to get done. But I know the minister, because I'm grieving as a minister for my people, I know the minister is feeling in these moments like they're looking for me to. Lee Shepherd, I, I got to do something. I'm just going, actually, what you got to do is just say, if you got nothing, just say, I got nothing. <laughs> you know what I mean, yeah. but you can help me and we can pray. We can figure it out. Uh, I understand that pressure. And believe it or not, as a black man, I never feel like I'm doing enough on this topic. I feel like everyone goes, what? Well, you're black. You should be, you right. know, aren't you the next Dr. King? <laughs> I, I, you know, I feel those kind of things. Sure. So, so yeah, the, it, but it's just part of the, it's part of the price of leadership, right? Yeah. That's no, why I, we do what we do, Z. No. And I, I love the idea of being authentic. And, yeah. you know, if you get, here's the thing, like, if you get discipled, if you make a mistake, that's the best part about our church is because everybody has to forgive you. Like they don't have a choice. Like they're going to be a Christian. Um, but don't try and disciple yourself before you let other people disciple you. Like, and that's, that's some, that's sometimes the feeling I get right now. Let me quick say something so that no one disciples me on my past behavior. <laughs> you know, let, let me get a blanket apology out there. And, um, you know, Oh, by the way, we're in a global pandemic. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, there's a lot going on, you know, how do you feel like the, the quarantine and having to do everything through Zoom and, you know, people staying at home all day, a lot of people staying at home all day. How, how has all of that affected what we're going through right now, do you think? Yeah, that's one of those things. That's like, you know, Matthew 4, when it's, the Bible says, and Satan left Jesus for a more opportune time. <laughs> you just kind of go, this is like an opportune time. Everyone's really scared of each other already. <laughs> no one trusts anybody. People are just like, don't touch me. I don't trust you. Don't come to me. Everybody's scared. We're outside. We're spraying down our packages. I mean, leave your package on the porch for three days. You can't touch. I mean, we were already scared to death of everything. And he goes, oh, yeah. And by the way, here's one you'll remember. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. And I mean, it was just a, it was a, it was a perfect storm, you know. However... I know that all of that fear and all of that anger and being trapped inside, you know, and 40, 30, 40 million people out of work, 
scared if they're going to go back to work? Are we getting ready to go into the greatest depression? I mean, people are using language like Great Depression. Everybody was scared to death. I mean, this was a world war. How many more people are going to die? You know, we were scared. We were we were ripe for something. Yeah. And um, I think it is for the disciple a right. They say an opportunity or crisis. And I think this is an opportunity. And I think that's the thing I've been hearing from, you know, even people on the, like I uh, sat in on a diversity call and I hear people saying this and man, this is an opportunity for us. It depends on how you approach life, right? This is like the totally. greatest tragedy crisis of all time. And some people, I'm, not, I'm more like that. It's a crisis, you know what I mean? Let me get your guns and they're going to deep. I'm like ready to take you like, hey, nobody's coming take him. You know, that's where I'm at. You know, um, defund the police and you, you watch. But I think it's that or it's an opportunity. Yeah. It's an opportunity. And I think Christians... We're built for these kind of opportunities. We're built for this. Um, so there's going to be plenty of opportunity uh, coming out of this. And uh, but yeah, I mean, we were I mean, we were already scared. We were already teetering in a lot of ways. And so yeah, I think it was an opportune time. But we are the ones that are built for this. Yeah. No, I agree. I mean for such a time as this, you know, yeah. Jesus built his kingdom and it's hard not to look at everything that's happening going, okay, God is orchestrating some, something like there is, there is, there is change. There is self-reflection that's happening that maybe never would have happened. There is some honesty and some storytelling and, you know, and, 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 and trauma, like the, 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 the reliving trauma and everything that you've talked about. I mean, it's hard not to believe that God is not trying to do something important right now with his yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, we're not dealing with anything different than people have had to deal with in humanity yep. since the beginning. Yep. There are times when we probably think this is the worst. It can get worse. <laughs> I know. Don't ask the question. Do not yeah. ask the question. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there was a tornado that tore up somebody. You're thinking everything else is going on and a tornado. <laughs> Just thinking, so yeah. it could get worse for us. Um, you know, there there are people who are losing family members or dying. I mean, my own father is, you know, he's he had a stroke a while back. He had broke his hip. Now he's got a blood clot. You know, I mean, he's older, certainly. I'm, 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 we're dealing with that and grieving that as well. So there are, there are other things going on also. Yeah. And I'm, that doesn't minimize any of this, but man, when my dad is not doing well, I'm just going, yeah, I don't know what's happening over here. I just got to laser focus on my dad in one sense. So yeah, we all have those things as well in life. So this is why grace and mercy in this moment, I mean, you know, it's really helpful because you really don't know that disciple that's responding that way. What else is going on? Yeah. And, oh. uh, no, that's very, that's, that's very wise. And, you know, Vince, thank you so much for being here. I have, you know, just one last question, you know, yeah. if you could kind of identify what, what you're most learning during this time, like what, what are you, what, what's something that you're taking away from everything that that's happened? Sure. Well, I mentioned that, I mentioned that piece there on, um, on dignity, uh, that really, like I've had that conversation with a few people and, and it's, you know, it makes me emotional and it makes me emotional, uh, other African-Americans as well. I really think that that's a part of this for some of the African-Americans. We just don't feel like we have any dignity. So I think that's an important piece of this. And so that's why I think everyone needs to listen and be attentive because I know that sometimes that, you know, Maybe, you know, someone who's not black goes, well, I don't see, I don't feel, I you know, and I just go, yeah, but sometimes people don't feel like they have any dignity. They feel like that guy naked and left half dead. And so I don't know what that's going to mean. So that's a big part of this yeah. uh, that I'm learning as well. I, I'm also learning um, how to make space for other people uh, during this time as well. Um, 
I'm learning how not to talk over people and to listen to people and to really calm myself down. When someone says something, I just go, oh, that, that, that ain't right. That, that's yeah. actually against the Bible. <laughs> I just feel like, you know, I just got to, well, let's just see if they have a David moment. Like David thought off, God, and by the end he go, but God, you're awesome. You know, so maybe they're going to have a David moment. Give them the benefit of the doubt. So just making space for people. I'm learning that as well. Um, so, and that's also helpful, I think. You know, and, and big thing is that I don't have to tackle this alone. I've got so many great people in my life that I need to talk to and am talking to, working with them together. That's been good as well. And I got to tell you, the other thing that I'm learning that I've just got to take a day off. <laughs> I mean, I, I know some of us are better than that, the others, but I'm telling you, dude, sometimes from sun up to sun down, it's like, it's just constant. So, you know what? I'm just going to go play golf. <laughs> <laughs> Oh. Yeah, I don't care if it's good golf or bad golf. I'm just going to play golf. And, you know, I'm not answering my phone, and I'm just going to get away. So I've learned that as well because I've definitely been like, I don't need no day off. I mean, I'm, I'm, I am I got an easy job. I'm in the ministry, you know. And so, uh, yeah, but, so I'm taking more days. I'm taking <laughs> more <laughs> well, Vince, thank you so much. You are without doubt, one of my favorite human beings. I look, I, I can't believe it's been so long since we've been able to hang out and see one another. What, when the conferences come around, yes. we find many, many opportunities to Absolutely. be with one another and so many of our other good friends. I miss you a I ton. You. I'm, so, I'm so proud of what you're doing in St. Louis. I, I'm so glad that you are there and that uh, the great people of the church there have been talking as their, as their leader and um, I miss you. I love you. Thank you so much for being with me today and for answering these questions. I love questions. you, man. I love you. You got some great, you got Hans there. and Anne. Oh, yeah. You've got uh, Michael D'Aquino there on your staff. Uh, you've got some awesome people there. Uh, I do love Denver. I love the church. Denver planted Lincoln, Nebraska. And um, I've told the story before, you know, they were going to plant the University of Utah, which is where I was going to go. And then I changed my mind and went to the University of Nebraska, within a month or two of that, Denver sent, the, you know, decided to send Lincoln out instead. So if it wasn't for Denver, you know, I wouldn't be here. So I love the Denver church. I love you guys. Uh, respect you tremendously. Thank you for training me and planting the church and, and being, I don't know, so dear to us. You guys are so you're an amazing church. And Z, I love you, man. You are, you guys are, yeah. You and me are some of the best people. You Like, Robin and I love you dearly. And so give Megan my love. I will. Can't wait to see you again, my friend. Oh, yeah. When when the airport's open and the and the vaccinations are out, we are having you and Robin out here. We'll, we'll, we'll take care of you. You can preach. Maybe you can even lead a song for us. Hey, love man, I, I love that. I love right. you. Have, yeah. a, have a great week. Bye-bye.